everyone, and welcome to another edition of My Life in Four Trades. Today, we have a special episode for you. My Real Vision colleague, Samuel Burke, had the pleasure of speaking with Pippa Malgren, former advisor to President George W. Bush. Enjoy this fascinating conversation. Really, the issue is trying to help people understand how inflation as a phenomena behaves. It's a big, slow-moving monster. And so the idea that you can just see an inflation print that's high and go, oh, we'll change policy now. This is not how this works. Pippa, welcome to the podcast. You are one of the most interesting people that I've met since I started my Real Vision journey. So I'm so excited for this conversation, in part because you have this incredibly diverse background, this diverse career, and this incredible family story, which I want to know is helpful or a hindrance at times. Um, But you're also an American based in London like me, so we have that in common. But I'm curious about how it all started and what your childhood was like and how that influenced who you've become come today. So take us back and tell us what younger Pippa was like. Oh, (laughs) well, um, (laughs) I wasn't a very good student. And I, I grew up in a really interesting household because my dad had been trained by like, I don't know, seven Nobel Prize winners. um, And he worked with Tom Schelling on game theory, which got the Nobel. Um, And my mom was J.R.R. Tolkien's like, pretty much research assistant because she spoke Middle English. Uh, And so this kind of fascinating world of, you know, brilliant people who just wanted to talk about everything. Uh, But I particularly loved hanging out with my dad, who taught me a lot about how the world economy works. And he worked for four presidents as the economic advisor. And he was part of the team on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he. what I realize now, decades later, is that he taught me to see the world from the Oval Office, like that global perspective where you it's you just can't say, well, I'm just a Japan specialist, right? You, you have to actually make a decision. And, and my mom taught me the power of stories. So the two together are quite useful. <laughs> and, and so do you think you were not a good student because that just isn't Pippa or because you had this education going around, around, uh, around you naturally? You didn't need the textbooks necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I was quite, uh, I just, I've never been great at, you know, the system. So, you know, they'd ask you this question, like, if the boy is six foot tall and the building is this tall, what's the degree of the angle? And I'm like, can't you just hire someone to do that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I don't know. I'm always questioning, like, why is the system set up like this? And uh, that's very useful when you're working at the level as an advisor to the president. And I wasn't really great for being in junior high school. <laughs> and when did you start to come into your own then? When did your career really start to take shape? And when did you have a clear vision of what you wanted your career to be and what you wanted to be. Oh, gosh. Well, really, that was college. I, I kind of realized at the end of high school that if I didn't get my act together, I was I was literally just a terrible student, no sense of deadlines, <laughs> couldn't hand anything in on time. And I realized I just I had to pull it together. And then I did and I had a super weird undergraduate experience where I went to three different colleges a very small women's college called Mount Vernon. And then they had an exchange program with Georgetown. So I spent a couple of years uh, at Georgetown working, doing political philosophy and military history with the Jesuits. And then I got into Yale as a visiting student scholar in my senior year doing um, ancient Greek military history. And what's really funny is all along the way, people were like, you know, you're never going to get a job with political philosophy and military history as your you know, majors, but it just somehow made sense to me. And actually, fast forward, they've proved to be really essential for everything I've done in my career. So anyway, then I wanted to um, see the world. And so that meant going to university for graduate school in Europe. And I got in somehow to the London School of Economics, did a master's and PhD. And then and then I realized, actually, the the heartbeat of the world economy is finance. So I wanted to work in the financial markets. And I did that for a long time before going back into politics again. 
that's the perfect segue into your first big trade because so many real vision folks will know you talking about geopolitics and venture capital and they know that you have this finance background but that's not necessarily where you are right now but it was where you were for this first big trade the dollar yen in the 1990s so set that up set that up for us where were you working what were you doing Sure. It was so much fun. So I was sitting on the trading floor at Bankers Trust. And I was, um, I, I think at that point, I was one of the currency strategists. And I remember I was like trying to explain, you know, the, our view about currency pairs and all the traders would look at their screen and they wouldn't even turn their head to look at me while I was talking at them because they were like, we don't even care, you know, you economists, whatever. We're trading. And one day we got uh, something across the Bloomberg screen and it was the um, sort of key person in Japan in the Ministry of Finance. And he said something. And because I had come from the political world in Washington and I literally spoke that language, I could see what he was saying meant something in particular. And all the traders thought it meant the opposite. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This definitely means this other way. And it happened that I had met this person and was able to have a conversation with them that helped us clarify what the real situation was, which was it was a misquote. And I realized that my personal network of connections, that I could find out information from policymakers. But not only that, I realized there's actually a bigger trade in this, which is that I, I know it sounds weird, but I speak both Klingon and Federation. I can explain the policymakers to the markets and I can explain the markets to the policymakers, but they don't really talk to each other very well. And so I came to a really strong view about the direction of travel for dollar yen, not based on any um, math and you know charts and numbers, but on understanding the political dynamics at the time. And so I made this you know, really big bet. We went from 82 to 135 in dollar yen during that period. And I was right, I got promoted to be the chief currency strategist of the bank. <laughs> but my team, particularly in New Zealand, and no good reason why New Zealand, just our best traders on the prop team were in New Zealand. And there were a couple of guys in particular, JT McFarlane, who went on to be the chairman of Deutsche Bank in Australia. He's a formidable figure in finance. And then a junior guy on his team called John Keyes, who went on to become the prime minister of New Zealand. Of and these two guys put some real money behind this thing. And they ended up buying a boat called the Pippa. <laughs> and I realized, <laughs> why is it these guys are making so much money out of my view, and I'm not making that much money. And that's when I started to understand the difference really between being a trader with the capital that you're betting, the actual prop trading portfolio versus being the advisor on it. But it was a great experience, a huge learning curve. And uh, and I and I still see the world. First thing in the morning, if you tell me where exchange rates are, I could tell you whether something's happened overnight or not, just from that. Well, it's so interesting because, of course, there's so many macro people in the real vision landscape. And so I'm always curious, I mean, how do you have this macro view when the politics are constantly changing? Well, I realized a lot depends on on the perspective you bring to it. So I was sitting there on the trading floor of a big global bank, a chief currency strategist, and I thought that was the ultimate view of reality. Looking back now, I realized it was like being at an eagle's nest on a on a high mountain. But, you know, then you go to the White House and now you have a satellite view. Like that's a completely different understanding. So, so much depends on the level of analysis, that initial condition that you bring. Um, but also, I think it's that it's not technical, this stuff. It All of it is politics and policy. Like, none of it is technical. And I know your trade was specific. It was on the pulse. It was about policy. But just taking that step back, I mean, do you think the world misunderstood Japan and the yen at that point? This is when Japan is coming off the glory years of the 80s and everything seems to be going wrong for Japan, except for the yen, which left a lot of people scratching their heads. But not you necessarily? Yeah, you know, and I was thinking back, it's so long ago, I can't remember all the details of, you know, how you arrived at the view, but part of it was also understanding how is the market positioned? 
And so that takes me into contrarian trading. And I think people misunderstand contrarian trading, or at least I think about it maybe a little differently. For me, it's not just opposite of whatever the market's doing. It's understanding, are there marginal additional buyers of the position or not? And if you know that 90% of the players have already put the positions on, then it's pretty likely that the slightest bit of information is going to push the trade the other way. And, uh. and if you really think that they've got it wrong, like fundamentally the story that they've created as to why the position is going to move in this direction is not technically correct, then you know it's just a question of time before it's going to move. And therefore, going the other way, you don't even have to be committed to all the reasons why it's going the other way. You're just looking at market positioning, saying there just aren't the marginal additional buyers of the position to keep it in place. It'll, it'll have to reverse at some point. So you talk about in the dollar yen trade in the mid 90s, having this perch, maybe thinking it was at the top of the mountain and then realizing it wasn't. But then you really get to the top of the mountain and go to the White House in 2001 as a special assistant uh, to the president, George W. Bush at the time. And how did you make that incredible shift? Or was it just coming home, given the family background? You know, it was not at all coming home. And the chances of me ending up in that position were just so remote um, because I hadn't worked on the camp. You know, I hadn't been like knocking door to door campaigning, which is usually how you get within range of those sorts of roles. What happened was I, I got this reputation for being the person who could explain the complicated stuff in plain English without making you feel dumb. And that meant I started getting lots of phone calls from people who literally just worked out they might be head of state in like the next year. And, you know, if, if you're going to be head of state, head of government, you will have a moment where you clock that this is possible, and then you start assembling your advisors. So one of them happened to be George W. Bush. And that was because the brilliant and marvelous Larry Lindsay was his economic advisor. And so he knew me and he knew we always compared notes. I was in France last week. What did you hear? I'm in Tokyo this week. What did you hear? We did compare notes on the world. And so Larry said, I think that you would be the right person. So I went off to Austin and um, we, I, George W. Bush and I hit it off like a house on fire. It was fantastic. And uh, he asked me to be his advisor on the international economy during the campaign, which, of course, was a minuscule part of what was going on in the campaign. Uh, and then he won. And so he offered me being in charge of all financial market issues. And I was like, absolutely, you know. It, when that kind of event happens in your life, I think I always say life sends you invitations and mainly mm. you should say yes, unless there's a good reason not to. And then, oh, my God, what I thought financial market advisor the president meant was nothing like what it actually was. <laughs> so so what was it actually? Did it change your idea of how how power works and what the inner what the inner structure and, and power circles of government are? It did. It did. Well, remember, again, the context. So we just had the dot-com bubble burst. People were terrified that the economy would never recover ever again. Um, and so we arrived with a stimulus package. And then we had seven of the nine largest bankruptcies in American history all happened in 12 months. So that was Enron, Tyco, WorldCom. I mean, it was just a massive car crash. And so I ended up working on Sarbanes-Oxley. And, you know, uh, this whole thing about, you know, what should the regulatory framework for the financial markets be was not something I dealt with in the markets themselves. So um, that was a a big jump and learning curve. And probably not what you expected a Republican administration to be doing, putting in, you know, more regulation instead of less. Mm. Well, you know, what we tried to do, just to be clear, we, what we're trying to do is uh, move the per well, move the personal accountability of the chief executive so that they couldn't say, oh, I had no idea that, you know, these things were happening in my company. It's like, yeah, but you have to because you are the chief executive. So basically what we did is said, 
everybody's accounts, you sign them personally. And initially that freaked every every chief executive out. But ultimately, it actually, I think, has been a good thing. There have been lots of bad aspects of Sarbanes-Oxley. But at any rate, that was one. And then, of course, 9-11. And 9-11, you know, that was a, literally a direct hit to the financial markets on one level. And I remember we were sitting in the... Um, uh, in the briefing room inside the West Wing when it happened. But at that time, you know, it's super weird. At that time, there was no Bloomberg terminal in the West Wing. And there had wow. been under Bob Rubin, but he paid for it himself because there's no budget in the White House to pay for a Bloomberg terminal, right? I'm like, wouldn't you just give it to them if you were Bloomberg? But no, everything's a sale. So we had no Bloomberg terminal. We didn't even have TV screens except in the corridors. So the young assistant to our team came in and she poked her head in the door. She said, excuse me, I don't know if this is relevant. I'm so sorry to interrupt the meeting, but a plane has just hit the World Trade Center. And we were all like, oh, poor guy, some Cessna pilots falling asleep at the wheel. And so we didn't do anything because we didn't realize. And then we shortened the meeting and I said, well, if it's hit the World Trade Center, this is the middle of the financial markets, I better go out and see. And then just as we stepped out, we saw the screen and the second plane hit. And then weirdly, we all knew without saying a word what it was. What we didn't know was what the heck do you do now? Because at the White House at that time, there was no evacuation policy for White House staff. There was only an evacuation policy for the president, the vice president, the national security advisor. But the rest of you are like totally expendable, right? <laughs> Completely replaceable. So there's no... Strategy. So you're like, uh, so I went back to my office and you just wait. And then the Secret Service basically told us to run because the plane was heading towards the Pentagon. When when all this was happening and you're, you're fleeing the White House, do you think in that moment or in the days to come, this is going to be a terrible, terrible recession, you know, some type of financial crisis like we've never seen before? Because I always look back on that time in, in high school and, and remember thinking the U.S. is about to go through something um, incredibly profound, which, of course, it did. But it, it didn't hit the financial markets as hard as as I would have thought when, you know, being in high school and studying junior economics. It was a relatively <laughs> mild rece recession compared to what would you know, come at the end of the, the Bush administration. You know, in that week, what was really uh, important was that no one understood how markets would function under these circumstances. And our initial worry was the bond market because Cantor Fitzgerald, which was completely wiped out being in the top of the World Trade Center, I think only the only people who survived in that company were the ones who weren't there that day. And um, they, I can't remember the percentage, but they were handling some huge percentage of the, you know, sort of G7 bond market and the particularly U.S. Treasury market, which was a concentration that we hadn't been aware of. And that was an issue all by itself. So the question was, oh, my God, can the market pick up where Cantor Fitzgerald left off? Like, how fluid is it? And so uh, my network, again, because I had been in the markets, I knew who to call. I called lots of different people. I always think if you're in the White House, it's really important to talk to a lot of different people. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes only one or two people influence how you make a decision. But I called a whole bunch of people and realized that actually the bond market's okay. They can figure this out. The stock market is a whole different thing. And what happened was the... Initially, so the power station that supported the New York Stock Exchange was underneath the World Trade Center. So initially it's on fire and then the firemen came and it's flooded. So both of these are super bad for electricity. <laughs> so, you know, you're like, OK, how do we turn the New York Stock Exchange back on? Um, you know, it's a, it's a different layer of the crisis from the immediate question of how do you deal with the humans who've been directly affected and, and the missing and the dead. But it was also this question, how do you put the markets back on so the world economy can function? Because, you know, everybody had an open position. And so no markets anywhere in the world could work because nobody could close the positions. Nobody knew where they stood. 
And it turned out it was really difficult to get electricity back to the New York Stock Exchange so that they could just flip the switch to forward the data. And it took a huge rigmarole to get it done. And we were really pushing, like, how quickly can we get this done? And the New York Stock Exchange were very nervous. They were frightened if they turned it on and then it failed, that would be a much worse situation. I'm sure anybody going in into the White House knows that they're going to have a front road to history and have some incredibly tough moments, but hard to imagine just how terrible what it would be, what you would witness. What were the professional and personal takeaways you had from taking on this gargantuan role at, at the White House? Uh, well, I didn't know how gargantuan it was until the pressure came. And I guess that's one of the things about that kind of job. It, it literally tests your mettle. You find out what you're made of. And the fact that nobody's getting any sleep and you're eating very badly and you're under the greatest possible stress conditions that exist um, is it, it matters because you find out what you're capable of, like truly capable of. And um, so, you know, and it was an amazing group of people. Uh, everybody brought different skills. And I maybe the most valuable thing some people had was humor, because you really need humor in those situations to just get you through. I mean, it's just so overwhelming and everything. A little bit of humor is always helpful. Um, and I also learned, you know, this idea you have in markets that the White House can do anything. They're like, well, and that the White House knows everything. You know, people used to always be like, so you know, what's your plan B? And I'm like, what makes you think there's a plan A? I mean, like, like you know, there's a limit to what's possible. And there's a whole lot of things competing for the president's attention. So the idea that the markets are off the top of that list, actually, just one last thing I'll say on that. What I realized in that job was that the markets imagine, imagine like an opera theater, you know, or a big stage. And the market guys all think they are sitting in the front row and Congress and the White House are listening to them. In reality, Congress and the White House see the markets as way up in the last row and they make they, noise They didn't know they were in the nosebleed section at times. <laughs> like a complete ego disconnect on level of importance. So that's important to keep in mind. Well, that was one of your best trades. And then you say one of your worst trades is actually what you thought about the Trump administration. You thought that Trump winning would be very good for the economy, which we know that it was, but that you didn't realize that it would cause a, quote, civil war. Your words, not mine. I'm curious, though, to start with the first part. What, I mean, how did you know that it'd be so good? Because I remember that night being in a newsroom and watching the dollar tank, although temporarily. And so many people who thought that Trump was erratic, that that could have a very negative effect on the market. So why did you think that it would be good for the economy when so many were, were doubtful? Yeah, well, it even went further than that, because I thought it was clear he would win. And almost no one thought he would win. Even his own team didn't think he would win. Um, and you know, again, it's so detail oriented at the time. What were all the reasons? But what I, as you know, I've been writing, uh, I had written a book called Signals in 2015, where I was talking about things that you can see, but they're not yet in the data, but they're important indicators of what's to come. So they're worth paying attention to. And I could I just felt the zeitgeist of the United States was moving in this direction where they wanted someone who was outside of politics, someone who came from the business community, a problem solver. They wanted somebody who could stand up to what they perceived as corruption in Washington. Um, and, and, you know, at the time, I could see why that actually might be needed. And so I bet that that was going to work and the, that Trump would win. I also thought it would be good for the economy. There was a whole bunch of policies that he had, lower taxes, much friendlier to business, you know, just a bunch of things that made sense that the markets would eventually go, actually, that is kind of good for us. What I, what I didn't appreciate was that he would go so far as to basically create a constitutional crisis. And um, 
I think that, you know, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, again, it wasn't a, a preference. I was not engaging in a choice. I was saying my prediction is whether we like it or not, he's going to win. And therefore, we got to deal with that reality, whatever that means. And what I realized is I didn't understand what that meant. I thought that that meant within the context of the system, he's going to shake things up. I didn't realize he would try to break the system itself. And as we're now going to see or not see, you know, was he behind January 26th, sorry, January 6th, January 26th is a birthday of my daughter. <laughs> but is it going to be, yeah. is January 6th, is that a situation where basically Trump and his team decided to effectively overthrow the Constitution of the United States? And that I did not realize. And looking back, what do you think that you missed? Were there signs? I mean, I always think back on Trump saying that the uh, primary election that he lost in, in Texas to Ted Cruz was rigged. He was saying, you know, so many elections were rigged. And that one really stood out to me because I thought, well, you're saying even the Republican primary is rigged. So to me, it wasn't such a stretch to think uh, about January 6th, maybe not the exact events, of course, I couldn't have predicted that, but all of this all of the actions and words that Trump said and did leading up to that actually was no surprise to me. So what do you think you and and other folks missed then? Uh, you know, again, I just, I missed that, the, and I'm still trying to explain it now, and it's super interesting, the feedback I get on my writing about this, but what we're really witnessing here is a clash of civilizations. You know, that Samuel P. Huntington came up with this concept I think back in the early 90s. And it was the idea that wars wouldn't be between countries anymore. They'd be between cultures. And mm. what we've had in America is a splitting apart into two cultures. And one culture thinks Donald Trump is a hero for protecting the United States against an illegal occupation of, the, of government. And that's the way they think about it. It's an occupation. And so they're a resistance. They're a freedom fighter. They are, you know, fighting against um, the, a system that has gone in a wrong direction. And then there's the other America, which believes that the system uh, is what is protecting America and must be protected at all costs, even from the president. And so this culture clash, this clash of civilizations, is very deep and very powerful, and uh, it continues. And, you know, people thought that when President Trump left office, that would be the end of it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He may be out of office, but he's not out of power. And we're definitely seeing that now. He doesn't have to be in office to be in power. And there's President Biden, who's in office, but arguably not in power. And so the whole nature of American politics is being exposed by the appearance of Donald Trump. And so one real question is, okay, so, but if he was gone, would this happen? I think it would have happened anyway. Someone else will replace him too at some point, because this is a clash of ideologies. He's just the personality who represents the voice of one side of the clash. So your view isn't that Trump is the cause, that this could have been or, or would have been another figure, even if it weren't Trump? Yeah. And I think also the view on the Democrat side that, you know, if only Hillary had won, none of this would have happened and we would have been fine, also is incorrect. There were there were deep, really profound issues driving the American public who are deeply disenchanted with the fact that they feel their standard of living has fallen. They're, they feel um, basically the promise of the American dream isn't believable anymore. And that broken promise, I always call it the breakdown of the social contract. You know, the social fabric is based on all these implicit promises, like you will, you've paid into your pension. And so you'll have a pension when you're 65. And then you realize, wait a minute, the government doesn't have that money. There is no lockbox. That money isn't real. I'm not going to get paid that. They're going to raise the retirement age to like 97. When I won't be able to get the money. As all these little threads of promises are broken, the social fabric weakens, the social contract breaks, and this was going to happen regardless of who ended up 
in the White House. And that's really what still has to be addressed. And none of the politics is really addressing that. That's become very personal rather than profound about the nature of the fundamental problem that's making Americans unhappy on both sides of the aisle. And I'm just curious, I'm actually not asking you this because we both happen to be based in the UK, but do you see those same factors happening in a place like the UK? I mean, Brexit is the obvious, you know, marker there, but I just mean in a broader sense of the world is really, really why I'm asking you that. Yeah, 100 percent. And that's what I argued in my book, Signals, was that these separatist movements, um, everyone thinks they're specific and local. You know, people in Britain were like, Brexit's just about us. Like, it's just our domestic issue. And Americans are like, the Trump thing, it's all about us. It's nothing to do with the rest of the world. But in fact, it's a global phenomena. And it's happening at almost every level of society. I mean, you do have a separatist movement, you know, in the state of Maryland, in the state of California, in Idaho, in Maryland. I mean, they're it's really interesting that it is occurring everywhere because basically when you ask the question, um, if government is breaking the promises it made to me, if it isn't able to deliver on the promise of making me better off, or if I'm not going to get rich before I get old, which was the expectation that I would have a better life, if this isn't true, then the obvious first question is, why are you in charge? And the why are you in charge automatically leads you to we could do this better without you. And that means you start to create your own government, your own. I mean, frankly, this is the idea of also behind that's been sort of co-opted, but into the new technology of crypto and fractionalized finances. You know, we'll join Bitcoin country. We'll have our own country. We'll have our own financial Because we don't assets, trust the establishment. Our own rules of the game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have separatist movements happening all over the world in all sorts of ways. And how are you adjusting your own portfolio allocation as a result of this, your view of the kind of breakdown of civilizations or clashes? I mean, my life in four trades. So so what is your trade then? <laughs> ah, it's so interesting. So I, again, I've always been quite contrarian. So when I worked in investment banking, um, I had nothing except my pension plans in the markets. Because I thought, this is crazy. My whole life, my income, my, my equity I hold in the bank all depends on the condition of the financial market. So if I buy stocks and bonds, I'm literally doubling up my risk. So I diversified into property. And that did very well for me um, in, the, in the 90s and the 2000s. And, um, and then fast forward later, I made a big jump into technology that I decided, you know, I, I'm, I don't know that I can trade the markets because I'm not in that same position with the knowledge flow that I used to be. But I do think that there is world changing technology now and it's this we're in a we're in something that's akin to the industrial revolution it's a it's an uber dramatic exponential advancement across the board in almost every technology and maybe i could be part of that and mm. that's what i've been doing and it's proved to be you know it's it's hard it's really tricky with early stage companies but you're learning curve alone is incredibly valuable. And the knowledge base I've achieved from that has opened incredible doors for me. And I'm now involved in all sorts of different uh, tech companies that are really exciting and interesting. So, so again, I'm, I'm not kind of playing the markets the way most of the Real Vision traders are. But I am, by the way, I am very upbeat and optimistic about this idea of fractionalized finance. Um, the kind of tokenization of the world, in spite of what has happened with the crypto markets falling apart. I think it's just like when the dot-com bubble burst and a whole bunch of really poorly built business models are have cracked up. But the underlying phenomena of the internet was just starting in the aftermath of the, of the dot-com bubble burst. And I believe it's the same with this world of fractionalized finance. We are at the very beginning of building the robust sustainable organizations and business models that will put them to use and it will totally transform how the financial markets work in future.
I want to shift to your fourth trade, which you list under one of your bad trades, and that's inflation. You say you started saying that it would return in 2011, and you were right. So is this just a classic story of, of time horizons? You know, so this is the thing. Like, I've literally been an inflationista. Like, <laughs> uh, so I started to explain in the aftermath of the financial crisis. I mean, it was so obvious, right? The Fed and every other central bank followed their lead. They basically said, we're going to take interest rates as low as they need to go and negative if necessary. And we're going to keep the market flooded with cash until the recovery comes. And we'll wait until we see inflation before we're going to act. And you're like, uh, okay, that means we're going to get inflation. I mean, it's like they told you. And whenever the central bank does this, then they cut interest rates to practically nothing. If you think as a trader, they're basically giving you free money. And if you're a good trader, you go, thank you very much. I will take it. I'm now going to bet it on the most risky thing I can find because why not? It's free. It's it, There's no cost associated with it. And so... It, the whole point is to get you to take your savings out of the bank account and go buy an apartment or invest in a high-tech business or put it to work. So I'm like, are people going to take their money and put it to work? Yes, they are. And so inflation is totally coming. Now, there are two things about this that are interesting, and I learned kind of only in retrospect. If you're a trader and you call inflation in 2021, everybody's high-fiving you as like the superhero, you got it early. And they look at me and they're like, you were wrong for a really, really long time. I'm like, I'm not looking at this as a trader. I'm looking at this as a policymaker. If I were a central banker, 10 years is exactly how long you need to get ready for this thing. Because you're driving like a wide load truck that's like overloaded. There is no way you can break fast, let alone turn on a dime. Like just uh, 10 years is about the minimum you're going to need to maneuver yourself into a place that you're not going to have inflation happen. And remember, you're supposed to act before you see the whites of its eyes. And so I think as a policy person, I totally got it right. But you're judged as a trader in the markets. And so the view is, ah, you got it wrong. And also, one last thing about this, too, is inflation went from pretty much zero to 2%. And people are like, that's no problem because that's inside the target. Yeah, zero to two percent is an unbelievable dramatic change in the inflation picture. It completely changes your investment strategy if you're a pension fund. And if you're a poor family, that is a crazy change in your standard of living in for, for the worse. Then to go from two percent to where we are now, you know, we're nearly in at 10, we're almost yep. in double digits. In that time period, so I'm like, hey, I don't call that wrong, and I don't even call that early. I call that it started to be correct, like, by by 2011, that's exactly when we started to go from zero to two, and then two to four and a half, and then suddenly, here we are at nearly 10. And that's how it goes. It's like slow, 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 but real. It's not that it was not there. It was going up, and then what's happened with Ukraine, with the political stress with China, that caused it to go exponential. I'm, I'm curious, though, because in doing my research for this and, and, and prepping and listening to you here, it's important to you that people know that you got it right. Is that because so many people have said, no, no, you got it wrong, or because you maybe haven't gotten the acknowledgement that you, you wanted in, in, your, in the various fields that you've worked in? Or is that more of just the, the philosophy of the short-term versus the long-term type of person that you are? I mean, we have set the stage for this thing. It's coming. And everybody's like, ah, you know, you're, they don't see it. So it's, it, that's hard when you go through a long period where everybody's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But really, the issue is trying to help people understand how inflation as a phenomena behaves. It's a big, slow-moving monster. And so the idea that you can just see an inflation print that's high and go, oh, we'll change policy now. This is not how this works. It's just, and so, yeah, I'm a bit on a mission to help people understand a phenomena that most of them have not ever seen before. You know, it's not that people forgot about inflation, it's they've never seen it before. 
Yeah. People like me, certainly I've never been in a market where I've had to report on or trade on this type of inflation. And not to box you in like people have done since 2011, but if I'm listening to you and thinking big picture, it sounds like you think inflation is here to stay for a long time. And you, you talked about needing 10 years to adjust around inflation for these you know, policymakers. Well, I think it's once you have it, it's super hard to get rid of it, like really difficult. But the good news is that there, we have kind of two competing sets of pressures. And so and you, and what we're witnessing now is both a supply side and a demand side shock that's pro-inflationary as well. Um, but I do believe technical, technological innovation is so profoundly powerful that ultimately it does prevent prices from continuing to rise. Um, we didn't have that in past episodes of inflation. So I'm not as worried that we're going to get into a hyperinflation as some people now are. There are hyperinflation people who really think we could end up in a Weimar Republic. You know, what happened to Germany in the interwar period where inflation really took off. I don't see that. I really don't. But I do think we're going to have an elevated level of inflation for some time to come. Uh, and people will just have to literally learn how to work that, how to get used to that. So, so it's neither the Weimar Republic, nor is it zero. It's something that means, yeah, probably you're going to be dealing with something between, you know, four and ten percent for a prolonged period. And also, by the way, it's really hard for the central bank to to knock this on the head. But it does sound like the Biden team really have clocked that, you know, in the end, once inflation really starts to hurt people, then it's a vote loser, right? At the beginning, yep, people like inflation because asset prices are rising and the stock market goes up initially, um, as it has up. done. Yeah, you're like, oh, I got a pay rise. It takes people ages to figure out, yeah, you got a 2% pay rise, but your standard of living requirements went up by 10 so you are losing, right? It's the difference between nominal and real inflation. People are like, what? What's the difference between real and nominal? It takes a while to like learn conceptually that you're still losing. So I think that the Biden team might start to get a little more focused on this. And there's rumor that Larry Summers might uh, emerge as the next chairman of the Fed. Uh, and I think if it is him, he'll be a lot more Volcker-like because now he doesn't care if anybody hates him. I mean, not that he has ever cared if anybody hates him, but I mean, like, he really doesn't <laughs> care. He will want to do what's required, and it's painful. It's like terrible medicine that you have to administer the economy. We've gone through all these, and I'm just curious, is one of these situations that we've talked about, is, is it your biggest mistake? I mean, what's been your biggest mistake, and what did you learn from that in your professional, personal journey? Oh, gosh, you know, life is full of mistakes. Um, like, there's like too many to even cite. Uh, I don't have any one in particular, because I do think that I, and maybe this is just a kind of spiritual element of my personality, but I do feel like fundamentally you are in the right place at the right time, at all times, even if it's really, really bad. Because even if it's really, really bad, there's a reason you're going through it and you're going to come out of it with lessons learned and, you know, a, a tougher skin and knowledge that you didn't have before. So you can't try to, I don't like this idea that you can optimize life and, and have a, like a perfect trajectory. Um, you know, it's, that's a, it's, I know it's a very popular idea right now. You could literally optimize everything. You can op optimize your sleep time and you can optimize your trading portfolio. You can optimize your dating life and da, da, da. I'm like, no, you can't. Life is about learning, which means you have to try things that are definitely going to be hard, take you out of your comfort zone. You're going to crack up and crash. It's going to be funny sometimes. It's going to be painful sometimes. But you can't get to the good stuff if you don't do all that, right? you got to like jump off a few cliffs. That doesn't mean even if you end up in the hospital with a broken leg, that doesn't mean it was a mistake. That means you you just learned a lesson, maybe in a harder way than might have been necessary. But I don't know, maybe you couldn't have learned the lesson unless you did it. I just think that's the thing. I don't view it as where did I make a terrible mistake? It's more like, well, that's where the universe took me. So 
<laughs> you just deal with what that is. I'm curious now at this point in your career how you view yourself because you dedicate a lot of time to your sub stack and I kind of view you as a journalist, this inquisitiveness you have. Do you see yourself as a journalist? No, actually, I really don't. Um, I feel more like I feel more like a sports commentator. Um, I've always felt that way, except like when I was in the White House, it was like being in, inside the boxing ring and you had to box, you had to win or get killed. And I prefer being in the front row going to watch the guy's left side, watch he's going to punch this way. So I'm a commentator and my job is to help people see what's coming. Not how did we get here, although sometimes people need help with that, but really, where is it that we're going and how can you position yourself to make money out of that direction of travel? Because it's it's the future that matters for, for investors. And uh, so I write about wherever I think the world economy is going to present uh, either a, a shock or an opportunity, um, and I try to weave together you know, what I see in the world of geopolitics and why I think it's going to touch the markets or what I see culturally, where are the cultural phenomena that are going to touch the markets? As I write about things like, you know, art and why artists are incredibly useful to keep an eye on because they're like the radar of society. They tell you what's coming way before they can articulate it even. They just show you with art what's what's coming down the pipeline. And uh, so I try to also just make economics what it is to me, which is just fascinating and interesting and drives me crazy. I'm often on stage with people and they have a way of making economics just so boring. And I'm like, how can you take something that's so fascinating and make it boring? <laughs> Pippa Malgram, making life and economics exciting. You do it on stage, on your sub stack and every time you're with us. So thank you so much for joining us on My Life in Four Trades. Thanks for having me. All right, that's a wrap on this week's edition of My Life in Four Trades. For more on the series, visit realvision.com forward slash my life in four trades. Make sure to use the numeral four. Hey, everyone. If you like this podcast, you should check out the full finance journey at realvision.com forward slash RV pod to get the full view of what Real Vision is all about. A video on demand platform you can watch anywhere. Our members get daily videos and analysis plus access to more than 3,000 videos for beginners and experienced investors alike, and live events online. To get started, visit realvision.com forward slash RVPod and use the promo code PODCAST10 to get 10% off our essential membership for the first year.